Hello, folks. Welcome to another edition of our podcast, Inside the Marble Palace, a look at the goings-on at the Saskatchewan Legislature and Saskatchewan politics in general. I'm Barry Mandrick. I am the political columnist for the Regina Leader Post and Star Phoenix. Joining me, as always, Jeremy Symes, our legislative reporter. Hi, Jeremy. And that hey. very familiar face, uh, Adam Hunter, CBC Provincial Affairs reporter. Thanks for joining us again, Adam. It was a busy week. Let's get going early, starting with the Premier's trip to uh, uh, London and uh, various points in Germany uh, to talk about trade. And in this case, uh, Ukrainian refugees, which I thought was actually more interesting. Jeremy, I'll just start with you. What did the Premier tell us yesterday in the teleconference back to Regina? Yeah, for sure. This trip was meant to promote Saskatchewan trade and and all of that, but they had to make a change in itinerary and meet with Ukrainian refugees just because of the changing circumstances. And so, yeah, he did speak about his time in Castle, Germany, which is where he went to a shelter there. It was an office building that was converted to house about 80 to 90 families uh, who fled Ukraine um, because of the war that we're seeing there. So Mo got to speak to a bunch of the families. They're mostly uh, mothers, grandmothers, and children. A lot of the men are still back fighting. And he shared some of his stories and uh, some of the stories he learned from some of the people there. One of them was this woman he met. Her house was completely destroyed by shrapnel. And so she and her family had to flee to, to Germany for safety. And I think he was really touched or just really moved by these conversations he had. He was talking about how um, a lot of people there are saying their their heart is still in Ukraine in a way, so they do want to get back home. But at the same time, you know, he wants Saskatchewan to find a way to help and support some of these refugees. So we might see in a couple of days or in a in a week or so, maybe some more details on what Saskatchewan is going to do to to help some of these refugees there. He wants to provide maybe some immigration aid and help Ottawa in a way there to potentially have um, people come to the province. The thing is, though, is he did acknowledge a lot of people see Ukraine as their home and they just really want to get back home. So what this might mean and how long they might stay, those are still a lot of questions that are answers we don't know yet. So that's what really stood out to me. Obviously, he also talked about trade and how Saskatchewan can promote itself to be a sustainable supplier of goods particularly because of Russia starting this war and being a main supplier for Europe and how Europe shouldn't really be relying on Russia because of, of what they've done to Ukraine. Uh, Interesting points. Let's pick up on those last two points by Jeremy Adam, because I thought one of them was a real eye-opener, that the Premier was actually looking at the world events is something other than how does this benefit our province or uh, our need and how does this actually how should we approach the refugee situation and how can we help them or benefit them? I thought was uh, a real awakening on the part of of the premier. Uh, I'm not so sure there was much value to the trade mission otherwise, because I didn't see any deals signed or anything announced, but from at least the standpoint of having maybe, maybe a broader view about people's needs, because that's what government's always about, you know, serving the needs of the people. Did you sense what I did in terms of, of, Scott Moe actually discovering something that maybe he previously hadn't thought enough about? The one thing I noticed that was maybe a little bit of a change was the, we've heard so much about bringing refugees to Saskatchewan and that Saskatchewan's door is open and that we're the best place because of our history and settlement success, et cetera. And this has been a push from the premier, the minister of trade and export. Uh, the slight difference in, in message I heard yesterday was that the, the admission, I think, from the premier that many Ukrainians don't want to come to Canada necessarily unless they're forced and that they would like to get back to their home, whether that's realistic or not, depending on where they live, where they fled and their circumstances. So there seemed to be a little bit of a turn to we're going to try and help people there however we can from here and he mentioned maybe helping with uh, staff who could go there and process visas or any sort of immigration expertise or refugee settlement help we can have here in saskatchewan i think as jeremy alluded to we're going to get more details on this This is obviously quite new and it's a bit of a turn as i said from what we've heard over the last few weeks since the war started and i and I, i think all of us can probably appreciate that you 
in a lot of situations, you have to kind of be there to see it, to understand uh, what people are going through. And that's not related to a war, it could be anything. Uh, and I think that that came through in the phone call that uh, Premier Mo was, was quite descriptive in what he'd heard from families, what he'd heard from people there uh, in Castle. And I think that's going to have an impact going forward on, on the government's immigration policy. Like, how could it not? And whether Saskatchewan has enough uh, to help or what we can actually do to sort of flex our muscles, per se, is, remains to be seen. And I think the other thing that that is something we don't necessarily hear, and it's something that people are very cynical about all the time, is this provincial government here in Saskatchewan, specifically working with the federal government on something, working together towards a, a shared goal. And I think this is one file where we see this over and over and over again. We hear it over and over and over again. The, the premier's name dropping the federal minister. He's saying we're talking. He said yesterday, I think that he'd just spoken with him. So uh, this is something that is, seems to be a focus of the government. Uh, it's going to be, I, I don't know what it's like in other provinces, but it seems like Saskatchewan is really pushing for this. And uh, the premier's message yesterday seemed to drive this home. On the trade front, I mean, Murray, we never really get specifics. No, we sure don't. <laughs> like we sometimes get an MOU, um, but a lot of this is sort of, as the government will say, is laying the groundwork, you know, s selling yourself, uh, selling investment. I think it's important, important to point out, too, that this, according to the government, this trip was planned well in advance of the war. And it's it may be seen as opportunistic now, especially with some of the, the products we do have in Saskatchewan that you, you, that Russia also supplies um, that were well placed now. And the premier mentioned this at SARM. He's mentioned this in many speeches that Saskatchewan can kind of fill this gap. And part of this trip was to do that. Now, it's going to take a while for us to all kind of figure out whether this trip amounted to anything, whether it helped, whether it didn't. And even then, it's tricky to kind of judge. Um, and the premier, this is the first trip he's taken since the pandemic started. He's, he's, he hasn't been abroad in quite a while. So that's another thing I think is kind of interesting. Let, let's move on to, some, to another global issue, and that's uh, the environment and how this provincial government tends to address this. We have a tremendous problem in this province with greenhouse gas emissions. And one of the things that drives it is our electrical generation that's still done by coal that we have to move out of very quickly. The government offered a solution or a joint solution with other provinces, including Alberta and Ontario this week, Jeremy, in terms of the announcement related to small modular reactors, which are small nuclear reactors. Tell us about their pitch, because it did seem to be a bit of a pitch, although to their credit, I think they are re-emphasizing greener sources like solar, like geothermal, like wind, uh, but really emphasizing their newfound love for small modular reactors. What did uh, Minister SAS Power Minister Don Morgan tell us this week about this story? Right, absolutely. So the pitch here with small modular reactors is really how they're pitching it is it'll be a way to reduce emissions in the province. They don't emit any air emissions, so that solves that front and it could help Saskatchewan get to net zero on the other front is it's supposed to be a, an economic boost to Saskatchewan as well. They want to in increase the value of uranium to about $2 billion, and these SMRs, they say, would be able to do that. And they say they could also create 100,000 more jobs and $16 billion in private investment. So I think that's why they're really going this route is because they can see the economic spinoffs while also making the argument that this, will, this has zero air emissions. And so we're playing our role in, uh, this, in the climate crisis we're seeing today. Obviously, we have a ways to go. They laid out a roadmap on SMRs. And so basically how it's going to go is on 20 by 2030, they're going to make a decision on whether or not they want to proceed. Even though no decision has been made, they're already strongly signal, signaling they want to go in this direction, but they still have to go through the regulators. They still have to select a site. They still have to do public consultations with people to see how they feel about it. Anyways, on 2030, if they decide, yes, we're going ahead with this, Saskatchewan could see its first SMR on in 2034. We don't know where it would be. And after that, we could see three more reactors in the future beyond that. I don't have the exact timeline on when those would be, but obviously very far out. Um, 
again, it, it's a way for them to, to say we're going to be reducing emissions. And it's also this idea of baseload energy. Right now, uh, with like wind and solar, you're dependent on the sun shining, the wind blowing, whereas with coal or natural gas, you're physically burning things to create energy. And so nuclear kind of fits that same uh, type of energy where you can physically control it yourself rather than rely on the environment to make the energy for you. Adam, you're a young pup compared to me, but you've been around long enough to see this debate happen uh last i think go around was 13 years ago when uh, uh the uranium development uh, panel was holding hearings and outright rejected large scale reactors smrs were in their infancy but infancy back then and perhaps not in the mix but they clearly are now do you see the mood changing for smrs in this province partly i guess because of the need to address uh, greenhouse gases quickly uh, in, a, in a more quick, uh, rapid way than we have addressed them right now. That certainly was part of Don Morgan's pitch in terms of if, if we're going to do something, maybe we have to relook at how we're, we have approached this particular issue and he cited a series of environmentalists that now kind of agree with that approach. Do you see it changing in Saskatchewan though, Adam, from, uh, from what's been a debate that's probably gone on your entire lifetime? Yeah, thanks for dating me. And I will date yep. myself also in that 13 years, racking my brain now. I remember actually uh, going out and covering some of these uh, consultations and they were like town hall type meetings and places like Yorkton and listening to people express either, you know, their concerns about this. And, and that was a different conversation, I think, Ray, as you point out, because there was it was about a reactor, a plant, uh, where to store nuclear waste. And that got a lot of uh, reaction. And ultimately, that, that was one of the first things I think Bradwell's government uh, had kind of endeavored to do. And ultimately, they didn't go through with it. But now, uh, I, I think there's there seems to be more of a appetite for it. And I, the, one of the things that's pushing it is this reality that we are going to be off coal at, if, according to you know different benchmarks and, and goals and, and rules that have been set out. And so what are we going to do to make up for that in this province, in this climate? And the criticism is, well, we need to invest more in wind and solar, as Jeremy points out. We're, we're reliant on the weather and those, for those, uh, those power sources. And people will say, well, if, if they're not you know, enough for the base load, let's just make more and make it more, more common. It might be easier said than done. This government is, is, you know, hasn't shied away from talking about hydro or geothermal, uh, and, you know, natural gas. None of these things are, are things they don't talk about. I think nuclear has been added to it. The, the addition of Ontario, Alberta, you know, New Brunswick into the conversation uh, is also interesting because there's sort of power and numbers here. And this is something I think that will get potentially more of a push to the federal government to, to, you know, like, let's fast track this. Let's try and work to get this going because of the federal government's own benchmarks and rules they've put in place. But again, this is so far away still, uh, you got to start somewhere. But 2034, as Jeremy mentioned, uh, you know, that's a long time to be waiting to, you know, come up with uh, alternatives that don't burn fossil fuels. And so I think there's sort of like that sweet spot that people are really looking for, where they can accept maybe that this is something the government's going to go to in the future, even if they have concerns about it but at the same time wanting the government to make more of a push. And I, I do think it's interesting that during the budget, we asked Minister Harpower about what was in their budget specifically towards climate change. And her answer was, you have to ask the environment minister. And that's not really an answer she gave for almost any other department of or thing we talked about during the budget with yeah. questions out. She wasn't deferring to other departments. She was accepting and saying, okay, well, in education, we're going to do this. Of course, she said, you know, for more information, you can talk to the minister, but she flat out kind of avoided that. And I think that that kind of messaging is something that, that still gets people's back up here in Saskatchewan. And they'll still say this government is maybe not doing enough towards the environment. And on, on our website at CBC, we have a story uh, quoting Bronwyn Ayer, Minister of Energy, and Minister Kading, the Minister of Environment, talking about maybe not being able to hit the, gov the federal government's projections and wanting to see more data from the federal government. So there's still that push pull. So while we're working together on immigration, we're still not really working together on this. And we should also mention the carbon tax is going up. And that's another sort of hot topic that is being brought back 
into the forefront because of the federal conservative race and it's kind of gets some more air into it and so that's another sort of aspect of this whole climate change talk that i think uh, is coming back up again uh, after being a little bit put to bed over the last, you know, let's say 18 months. The, the so. mixed messaging is fascinating on on the uh, on what we're hearing from the environment minister Kading and 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 the energy minister Air versus what we heard from uh, Minister Morgan this week about their commitment to meeting some greenhouse gas goals, and and that's fascinating. It's it's always fascinating to me how old problems keep resurfacing. Uh, and another issue where that happened this week, obviously, was on the mental health issue. But once again, the, the only good thing about being old guys is that you actually kind of get to see them look relooking at problems and coming up with new solutions. And while no one is probably going to be terribly satisfied with some of the solutions and commitments to dealing with mental health issues, particularly for youth, it actually is encouraging that they actually are taking this issue more seriously than they have in the past. Now, still not good enough, to, according to uh, a lot of people. Let's talk about that this week, Jeremy, and why addressing mental health issues for children still is inadequate. Yeah, that's a really good question. So we had a report from the Saskatchewan Children's and Youth Advocate, and the report really focused on mental health. It was called Desperately Waiting. So the advocate interviewed about 500 individuals, youth and children experiencing mental health challenges. And, you know, kind of it painted this picture of, you know, youth experiencing depression or engaging in self-harm and drug use. And they also had these fears of being judged and they're trying to navigate this system that really isn't working well for them. We were, I thought it was great that we got to speak with two young people who joined a press conference to really share their own personal Great story, by the way, about, about those young people, Jeremy really worth looking up. Oh, thanks. Yeah, for sure. And what I understood from them is they're kind of caught in the middle, right? They don't necessarily need to go to hospital for help, but staying at home and getting support at home isn't good enough either. So we're missing this middle piece here, uh, this middle ground for people to get um, some mental health support, whether it's a residential program or just access to more counselors and that sort of thing. And so that's what they were really talking about. And it was among the 14 recommendations that uh, Lisa Broda, the advocate, did release. You know, we need this middle tier system. We need to reduce wait times. We need to look at um, our detox spaces. And we need to develop a, a children's strategy that really gets the ministries together and really reevaluates mental health in the province to tackle this issue. She obviously said, you know, not, nothing or not much is being done and we need to do more. I did ask Health Minister, Minister uh, Everett Hindley about this as well. And he acknowledged, you know, we do need to do better on this front. He wasn't uh, really defending the, I mean, he was kind of defending the government's record saying we do, we are doing more investments, but he did have that sense of acknowledgement that, okay, I guess we're not doing enough here and we will do more. Um, these recommendations haven't been accepted by the government yet. They are still uh, under review and we'll, we'll be watching closely. I guess I'll point out too, because it is a historical issue, like you said, and uh, Broda was mentioning, I think there was a report back in like 2014, uh, addressed mental health. Nothing really happened since then. And she was saying ministries weren't really aware of this report. There was a report back in 1993, and I think another one sometime in between those two. So again, it's, it's an ongoing thing and it seems to get dropped or overlooked. So we'll just see where it goes from Adam, here. Adam, you understand retail politics really well, probably better than I do. And what, one thing I'm kind of curious about in terms of, of your perspective is whether you now see this particular issue actually moving forward simply because it's become something more in uh, that the public's more aware of that has uh, greater retail value to governments addressing? Because I think, as Jeremy said, that's why it hasn't been addressed in the past. You generally had governments that couldn't win political points on this particular issue. No one really wanted to talk about it. But I think that is changing. And I'm very curious on your take as to maybe why they haven't done more in the last few years and whether you actually see that as something that's changed based on what you saw this week and what you've seen of late. I think I think in general the, the the issue of mental health and talking about it openly is something that's more accepted than it has been in, in recent years and even going back to as Jeremy mentioned 2014 let's say or 2016 when this 
this issue was sort of raised again that came up today in the, in the, in the legislature this week. I think that's the first step. So people aren't afraid to talk about it. The politicians aren't afraid to talk about it, whether they're in power or in opposition. Uh, it's something that we see, you know, multiple causes. Um, we have people speaking up for and politicians, you know, whether they're photo ops or whether there's true money behind it. That is something that's more common, I think, than it has been in the past. But if you have a short memory, uh, you know, the pillars of life uh, strategy, if you want to call it that, from the from the provincial government has been panned by uh, many people in this space and the opposition has railed against it. And it's one of the things that caused Tristan DeRocher to, you know, camp outside the legislature and make his trek down to Regina and stay there. And that's something that even at that point, the government was, you know, choosing to sort of ignore uh, him, the premier, certainly uh, by not meeting with them. And the government got a lot of flack for that. Um, I think this has changed slightly, Murray, over even the last year or so. We've had seen Doyle Vermet from the opposition, their, their member for Cumberland, who has raised this northern suicide specifically again and again and again and again in the House and was turned down for his you know, private member's bill many times until finally it was accepted by the government and there was sign of a show of unity and it was, you know, honestly a nice moment. Uh, inside the assembly, but then we have this week, and Jeremy knows this, and Murray, you know this, Dole Vermette came out daily asking for a strategy, asking for a plan. And so this isn't going away, and this is one of those things that the government, because they're the government, they own it. They have to uh, make some progress, and we'll hear Minister Hinley and other ministers list off initiatives and spending, and I think this is one of those things that's tough to judge, right? Because uh, I think targeting an issue like this that's so vast and so wide and it cuts across different ministries is is challenging uh the one thing that i think jeremy pointed out that i think is really interesting and i know we've talked about this you know off of this chat is is that middle ground is yeah. the people that are obviously in need of emergency care they need beds now okay people can understand that you know there's a need you need to find that need or people that need counseling whether that's school counseling um, and they may be, you know, experiencing some mental health issues, but they're not in that middle space where there seems to be a lot of, of, of trouble. And in the report, you know, the, the, the children's advocate was quite critical of people having to wait forever, if at all, to get a meeting, to get counseling um, that she said, you know, that the program needs this needs more resources or a complete restructuring. We're not talking about tweaks. We're not talking about throwing some money at this issue. And I think the other thing is people in the general public are more comfortable coming forward, as we saw this week, telling their stories, tragedies in many cases that they deal with and their family has dealt with to try and shed some more light on this issue. And that will continue to raise it in the public's eye and it will have to get the government. Absolutely. Attention. And that's how we build forward. I wish we had more time to talk about all this stuff this week, but we're, we're, we're quickly drawing to a close. One other issue that I... I uh, I want just to touch on briefly, if you can, guys, start with you, Jeremy. Digital IDs, the government was seen to be going forward with a plan. It's not now. Can you just quickly explain what changed? Yes, absolutely. So the province announced yesterday that they're going to be pausing, looking into this idea of digital ID. We'll take a step back. They put out a request for a proposal to bring forward some kind of digital ID roadmap or plan in Saskatchewan. Basically, this would let you access maybe your SGI or some other services um, online where you could sign in using maybe like a face ID or something like that. And the whole goal really was to make it easier for people to access services. So the government had mentioned, you know, we've heard from people saying they can't access services quick enough. You have to go wait in line somewhere. You have to go be on the phone with someone. So we really wanted to make it easier for people. However, this has become quite the topic online. There's some conspiracy theories about it. I'm not going to get into them because I don't fully understand them. But there was also, you know, the concerns about privacy, right? And um, people having uh, potentially issues with their privacy around this digital ID. So, and it was raised at SARM too, right? So anyways, Minister Ryder spoke with him yesterday. He said, we heard concerns from people, so we're going to be pausing this for now. It's possible they might look at it in the future. I have no idea when, he didn't describe when. And it was also quite expensive too. 
He said it would cost millions to roll this thing out. He didn't provide an exact cost estimate because of proprietary issues. But um, yeah, that's the state of digital law ID and it's we're going to be looking to other provinces to see what they do first before we embark on our own plan here in Saskatchewan. Well, Adam, do you think they're watching us right now as we speak? I'm not sure. I'm so sure on this podcast, to be honest with you. But what, what drives oh, government to are. do this? I mean, like, I mean, the fear right now is that they're actually being way too governed by by the paranoid. Yeah, I think this is a tricky one because uh, there is that element, as Jeremy pointed out, I think that's completely valid that there is, you know, conspiracy talk and that you'd have to go very deep into the Internet to find that uh, specifically about Saskatchewan. Uh, but Minister Ryder, as Jeremy mentioned, did talk about privacy and that being a concern. And we see this with this government quite a bit that they will slow play something and wait for other provinces to do something. It doesn't necessarily have to be digital ID. It could be any any topic and they'll wait for the other province to make that choice, see how it rolls out, and then make their decision and maybe experience their own growing pains before going through with it. And I think that's what we're going to see here if this becomes a reality at all. Absolutely. God, we covered a lot of ground this week, guys. Thank you so much. Complicated issues yeah. that aren't easy to to boil down in any, any week. Hopefully we'll get into them in more detail in the next episode of Inside the Marble Palace. Jeremy, Adam, thank you so much for your time. Anytime, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, yeah.